So what does it mean to take the grace of God in vain? And how do you make sure that you are not doing that? That's the topic for today's video. So let's get to it. While them are play, play, the rest of so if you know that you've received the grace of God, you probably want to make sure that you are not one of those who are receiving the grace of God in vain, right? Let me know in the comments below if you want to make sure that you are not receiving the grace of God in vain. And while you're at it, tell me at the start of this video, what do you think it means to receive the grace of God in vain? You see, brothers and sisters, when Paul is talking about this to the Corinthians, he makes sure that he says, I am pleading with you. Please do not receive the grace of God in vain, which means that this is something that is a vital, critical, important to you and I as Christian people. So what does it mean to receive the grace of God in vain? And how do you and I make sure that we are not doing it? Let's look at what the word has to say. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. Good morning. I'm Father Jabril. This is Job Bread TV, where we dive deep into the word to make sure that you are equipped for your journey to the promised land so that you can navigate the wilderness and make sure that you arrive at the gates of the kingdom of God. Uh, and so as we look at the word for today, we'll be focusing on a second Corinthians chapter six, verse one, second Corinthians six, verse one, where Paul is talking to the Corinthians, of course, because it is second Corinthians, but he is talking to them and he says, we then as workers together with him also plead with you not to receive the grace of God in vain. Paul is saying to the Corinthians, please, 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 whatever you do, whatever you do, do not receive the grace of God in vain. And so if we see that Paul says that, then we all should want to make sure that we are not receiving the grace of God in vain, right? Let me know. You want to make sure that you are not receiving the grace of God in vain? Put that in the comments and let me know just to make sure that we are talking the same language, right? But we want to make sure that we are not receiving the grace of God in vain. The problem is we don't really know what that means. You know, when we have conversations, when I have conversations and I ask people, what does it mean to receive the grace of God in vain? You know, I get responses like, um, well, it means to not take it for granted. True. But what does that mean? And so we'll say that you're supposed to use it rightly. OK, also true. But what does that mean? And so we must dive deeper to really understand if Paul is pleading with the Corinthians and with us to make sure that we do not receive the grace of God in vain, you and I should want to be clear about what that really means, right? And so let's look a little closer at what the word is saying. Look at 2 when... Corinthians chapter 5, just before, uh, verses 18 through 20. Paul says, now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. And there is the key, brothers and sisters, for us to not receive the grace of God in vain means that we have to be reconciled to God. And I think the better word, right, when we look at the Greek, the better word is that we have to be conciliated with God. Conciliated means that we no longer have any animosity. We no longer have any distrust. We no longer have um, any hostility towards God. Now it becomes a little bit more clear because we can receive grace and still be hostile, right? I mean, we see it all the time, looking around, look at the news. We receive grace, but still harbor hostility. I mean, I think about it from your childhood, right? Like, you know, you get gifts and, and, and whatever happens and your parents will, 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 will do the world, you know, that whatever the world is for them, right? You know, parents of various means provide the world in various ways to their children. But 
wherever your parents were, whatever their means were in their own way, they endeavored to hopefully somebody in your life, parents, grandparents, coach, somebody endeavored to shower grace upon you, right? To give you some, some, some help, some assistance in order to accomplish the goals that you wanted to accomplish. But not all the time were you grateful. Not all the time did you, uh, cease your hostility towards that person in your life. So you may have taken the gifts. You may have taken a new car. You may have taken a new computer, the new pair of shoes, the new suit, the new whatever, the new this, the new that, the opportunity here, the opportunity there. They might have flown you across the world to do all kinds of things. And you took them and you had a blast. You had a ball. It was awesome. You know, lights out, every party, you know, turned down for what? But still harbor distrust, still harbor hostility towards them, right? You understand what I'm saying, right? Let me know if you understand what I'm saying about receiving grace while still being hostile to the person that is giving you those gifts. And so that's what Paul is talking about when he says to them, I am imploring you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God, be conciliated to God, be over, be done with distrust, be done with hostility towards God. Because here's the reality, right? As we walk this Christian life, we receive the grace of God and then we read the word of God or we hear from and sense the spirit of God telling us to do things, telling us to act in certain ways, telling us to love one another. And we don't really trust that we can love, right? We don't really trust that we can be the Christian people that we are supposed to be. We don't really trust that we can love our neighbor, that we can love our enemies, that we can share, that we can give. You know, we don't really trust those things. And so, yes, we've received the grace of God and we are lavished with it and we are basking in it, rolling around in the grace of God while still being hostile towards him who gives us grace. I mean, you don't believe me? Look at the news. I mean, here it is in, in, in the backdrop of Flag Day as the, in the prelude for the 4th of July. America, America, God shed his grace on thee. Now, note, God sheds his grace on everyone, on all countries. Grace is available for everyone and not just for America. But America, America, God shed his grace on thee. And that is true. God has indeed shed his grace, just like he shed his grace on the saint and the sinner alike. God has indeed shed his grace on thee. But how are we using his grace? Are we using his grace uh, rightly? Or are we using his grace in vain? And so that brings us to the question, what does it mean to use his grace in vain? What does it mean to take anything in vain. Let's not talk about his grace for right now, but just anything, anything that you can think of, what does it mean to take that thing in vain? Well, when we look at what it means to do something in vain, it means to do something without profit, to do something in a way, to take something in a way that does not profit you nor the person that gives it gives it to you. You know, as I prepare, my son's going to high school now and college is on the brain and you start to think about all the things that you're gonna do to, to, to set your children up for success. And, but we think about parents, right? And so parents, they may give you something, let's say you were about to go to college and this is back in the day when we were growing up and, you know, laptops weren't the thing. And so, you know, you get a new laptop and it is the top of the line laptop and you are supposed to use that laptop in order to advance your career, in order to advance your schooling, your education, to write your college essays, to be able to thrive in that collegiate environment and, 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 and rock the world, right? And so they give you this laptop, high-powered laptop. It is bells and whistles everywhere. All your friends, when they see it, they're like, ooh, ah, oh, wow, right? And so you get this laptop, but do you use it for, you know, college applications? Ah, nah. You use it for games, you use it for YouTube, you use it for all kinds of things except for the thing that it was given to you for. You take it in vain in the sense that, not that you had fun playing games, but you take it in vain in the sense that it does not bring you any profit. It does not bring your parents any profit. And when we talk about profit, we ain't talking about making it rain, we ain't talking about prosperity gospel. What we are talking about is something to advance your life. 
And so your parents give you this tool in order to advance your life, to set you up for success. And you take advantage of the tool, but you do not use it in a way that advances your life. And so you take it in vain. And so the question becomes, why does the Lord give us grace? And the answer is found in what Paul says. The Lord gives us grace that we can be reconciled to him, that we can be conciliated to him, that we can lose our hostility, that we can lose our distrust, that we can be returned to friendly relations with the Lord, where we would trust what he says and do as he says and not question as what he says. And so what Paul is saying is that you and I have to take care to be reconciled to God. If we are reconciled to God, then we will be taking his grace pro appropriately, properly. We won't be taking it in vain. So the question, the deeper question becomes, what does it mean to be reconciled? What does it mean to be conciliated? What does it mean to be, to lose that distrust? And what happens as a result of it? You see, once we are reconciled, rejoined, conjoined to God, like Christ, who is fully human and fully divine, once we are reconciled to God, we are enabled to love like God. And this is what Christ himself is talking about when he says, behold, a new commandment I give unto you that you should love one another. I mean, think about it. There's nothing new about loving one another, right? I mean, everybody says that. All religions say that you're supposed to love one another. Every great uh, spiritual leader has said that you must love one another. We all talk about love. So why is Jesus saying that this is a new commandment and what makes it new? What makes this new is that the type of love that Christ calls for us to have is not the type of love that you and I have. It's the type of love that God has. And so what's the difference? You see, the type of love that you and I have is a relational love. You know, I can say that I love you and I mean that I love you, but I have no idea who you are unless you pay the comment and say hello, right? But I have no idea who you are. How do I really tangibly love you? Something happens to you in your life. Uh, will I pick up the phone and call you? I don't even know your number, right? Will I even, will it even bother me? Will I do more than put up my thoughts and prayers? You see, the love that we have as human beings is a relational love. Because I'm in relationship with you and I like you, because you are my brother, my sister, my mother, my father, my son, my daughter, my cousin, my co-worker, my somebody I know, the person that I see on a regular basis, any sort of relational thing. Yeah, I love you. I can wrap my mind around that love and I can care enough about you in order to do things that I would not normally do. However, for those that are outside my sphere, do I really love? America, do we really love? Look at what is going on in immigration. Look at what is happening with the children and being separated. And, you know, uh, everybody knows that if it were the children of those who say and support this policy, they wouldn't want their children to be separated from them, regardless of what the law says. They also know that if it was the child of their cousin, of their aunt, of their sister, of their brother, of whatever, they would not want that child separated. They would have compassion in that situation and they would be able to love. But because they have no relationship with those who are coming from elsewhere, they don't love. That's not the love of God. The love of God is beyond the love that you and I are capable of doing on our own. The divine love of God is beyond what you and I can do unless we are reconciled to God. However, if we are reconciled to God, we are now able to love in the way that God loves. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that any who should believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. I mean, let's think about that in the American context as we look at immigrants coming from left and right, trying to get to this place. If indeed America wanted to be the Christian nation that it claims to be, let's think about that. That we so love the world that who, all whoever shall believe in the values that we hold 
should not perish wherever they are, enduring whatever they have to do, but shall be welcomed and enabled to have everlasting life. I mean, imagine that. What do you think about that? How does that resonate with you? Let me know in the comment section. You see, brothers and sisters, this is indeed what we are talking about when Paul says to not take the grace of God in vain. We are to be reconciled to God so that we can share the love of God that others might be reconciled to him too. And there is profit, right? I mean, imagine you receive the grace of God and by the grace of God, you enable to be reconciled to God. You put away your hostility and now you are one with God. It indeed profits you because being able to be one with God, now you indeed have the strength, have the wisdom, have the insights in order to walk worthy of the calling to which you have been called through this wilderness and into the promised land. It is profitable for you. It is also profitable for God because once you are reconciled to him and enabled to love as he loves, you can share the love of God out into this world in all corners of this world where love is not known and others, those who need to be heard in an acceptable time, who need salvation in, in that great day would be able to receive that love, receive that grace. And by doing so, they can become reconciled to God and being reconciled to God, that profits God. Everybody profits. And then, then we have made sure that we have not taken the grace of God in vain. Brothers and sisters, that's the tragedy as we look as we see what is happening in our country. America, America, God shed his grace on thee. Indeed, I am not going to say that he hasn't because I know God. And God shares his grace with everyone. God, like the sower, sows seed everywhere. He doesn't care where he sows seed good ground, bad ground, stony ground, thorny ground, fertile ground, doesn't matter. He sows seed. And so God indeed has shed his grace on thee. But how are we taking his grace in vain? I want to hear from you. Let me know in the comments where you see the grace of God being taken in vain. And more importantly, what would it look like to pour out the divine love of God in those areas where we are taking his grace in vain. Cast your vision of what it would be, what it would look like, how we would be, how we would act, what we would do as a people who understand that yes, indeed, God has shed his grace on us and we are going to do whatever we can do and everything we can do to make sure that we do not take his grace in vain that we take his grace in a way that is profitable for us as we journey through this wilderness to the promised land, that we take his grace in a way that is profitable to him such that his grace can abound and all people will come into the knowledge and the love of his grace and be reconciled unto him. Brothers and sisters, if you and I have been saved, if you and I are being saved, if you and I will be saved, we must also be reconciled to God. And being reconciled to God, brothers and sisters, we must embrace and share a love that is transcendent, that is supernatural, that is extraordinary, a love that is divine. Let us pray to the Lord that we indeed might receive that love ourselves so that we can share that love in these critical times. We must be better, brothers and sisters. The Lord has died for you and I to be better, not to be divided on worldly politics, but to be united in the truth of the gospel. So let us confront that truth that we may receive his grace rightfully and not in vain. Amen.